And there came a day, a day like no other, when the horror genre stood threatened by the forces of evil. On that day, the horror show with Brian Keene was born. Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Dave Thomas, Matt Wilderson, along with occasional co-hosts Phoebe and Dungeon Master 77.1, these ambassadors of horror stand at the door, bringing you the biggest names in the business, as well as tomorrow's superstars. Now, here they are, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. And welcome back once again to the horror genre's number one podcast, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene, here for episode 275. Certain people, I'm not going to say who, but naysayers out there, (gasps) in our first year on the air, said, yeah, it'll last about 20 episodes, and and then he'll get bored, and he'll move on to something else, because that's what he always does. But here we are, six years and 275 episodes later, so, I don't know, suck on that, right, Dave? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Later in the show, we have Daniel Krause. He's going to sit down with me for an intimate look at his posthumous collaboration with George Romero, The Living Dead, on sale this week. Now, he's been on a press tour, uh, actually more of a, a press blitzkrieg. Um, and, and we, we talk about that, but, but he revealed some things to us that I haven't heard him mention elsewhere. Uh, so it's an interview. It's one of my favorites from this year. I can tell you that already. Uh, and I, I hope you folks will stick around for that. Uh, here in the studio with me, uh, Matt. Hi. And Mary. Hi there. And Dave. Uh, just want to let you know that, uh, my wig's on straight. Yes, this is another episode of Things Phoebe Says at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, and speaking, <laughs> speaking of Phoebe, joining us for the first time since the pandemic has started. Woo! Phoebe back here in the studio. Hello, everybody. Hello. So, all right. Um, I think the only thing we have to talk about is last weekend's Scares the Care virtual charity event. Now, I should mention there is another news story. But we're not going to talk about it. Uh, Robert M. Price, who Dave and I have talked about on this show yes, many times, many times, uh, <laughs> did something monumentally stupid, even for him. Oh, yes. Um, but <laughs> the authors that were impacted by this reacted immediately. And, yeah, it was fantastic. And handled it with grace and gusto. They harshed showed with Brian Keene that situation. <laughs> Yes, they did. Yeah, they did. And it went from being a huge news story to resolved in the space of like six hours. Yes. So we don't even need to talk about it. That is very – that's very efficient. Yeah. It was very efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Kudos to – Although it's just – it's egregious. Like people don't don't work with this guy. Yeah. You know, shout out to to Cliff Biggers and Charles Rutledge and Paul Mm -hmm. McNamee and everybody else uh, that was involved with that. And, And Rich Johnson at Bleeding Cool. Who did report the story? Yep, uh, because he knew, in fact, that we were busy getting ready for the Scares at Care virtual charity event, and therefore he would have a monopoly on the story. <laughs> um, so, yeah, last weekend we raised eighteen thousand three hundred and fifty-seven dollars <laughs> for Scares twenty twenty recipient families. Um, for those who missed the stream, uh, those families this year are Ashley Adams and her daughter Natalia who has Marfan syndrome. Uh, we've talked about Marfan syndrome on this show before. If you go back to, I think, Paul Tremblay's first appearance. No, his second appearance on the show. Um, you know, they thought he had that for right. a long time. So we, we've talked about that. Um, Laura, she's our breast cancer warrior for this year. And Patricia, uh, who suffered second and third degree burns to the entire right side of her body. As Joe Ripple brought up on the stream, her accident is just eerily. Similar yeah. to my own, like the the same exact thing happened, but she got it a lot worse. I, I guess they they didn't get it put out as quickly as they got mine put yeah. out. Um, so yeah, we we raised eighteen thousand three hundred fifty seven dollars for them. Our initial goal was ten thousand. We hit that about halfway through. We raised it to fifteen. We flew past that. Um, and if you watch the stream, we were able to give Ashley and Natalia a yeah. check. Live on the air, um, yeah, that was a really heartwarming moment. Oh, that, that that's what it's all about. 
Um, so that was cool. Um, I thanked all the actors and authors and artists and SS, SFX people and everyone else. Uh, I, I did that online. Go to BrianKeen.com and you, and you can read the list and you can say, okay, I'm going to buy this person's book. I'm going to watch this person's movie. All those people donated their time. They did it for free. Um, you know, we, we had some people who wanted to be with us, but couldn't because of technical issues like, uh, poor Summer Cannon and John Dugan. And they tried. And, I mean, God know, help them. They tried. Um, Jay Wilburn, who right as he's <laughs> moderating a panel and right as his panel's about to start, yes, he loses power he in his house. Uh, moderating a panel on witchcraft, by the way, yep. <laughs> and religion and magic. And, <laughs> yep. and of course, uh, <laughs> Night- Nightmare on Elm Street's. <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street's Jack Shoulder. He had a family emergency come up. Uh, mm. You know, Jonathan Mayberry, Tim Seeley, uh, the Sisters of Slaughter. You know, we had lots of folks trying, uh, but it wasn't their fault. Do not blame them. But, yeah, you go uh, go to BrianKey.com and you can read a list of everybody who participated. And uh, you can thank them. I want to thank you, Matt. Look at the look, look, the look of fear on his face. Where is this I'm going? I'm in constant danger. <laughs> you, you never, you never moderated a panel before before this event, <laughs> um, and I can tell you by the view count on both YouTube and ScaresToCareWeekend.com, and by the feedback we've been getting from viewers, your panel was one of the favorites among yeah. viewers. Aww. Uh, it was so, fantastic. Yeah, it no, really was. It was my, it was my favorite panel, job. I think, of was the whole day. Was it my Mortal Kombat arcade machine? I, I don't that know. That was part of it. That was part of it. I did catch somebody's like, is that a Mortal Kombat? I was like, yeah. well, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> People did like that. Yeah. <laughs> No doubt about I mean, that. I planned out. I was like, where am I going to sit? And I was like, well, I've got arcade machines. Why not yes. sit next to one of those? <laughs> yeah, no, you did You did great, man. Thank you, man. Um, I, I appreciate I, it. I think the panelists were, were impressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the viewers were definitely impressed. Uh, it was an active, lively, fun panel, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, Dave. Yes. We were supposed to have this conversation off the air, but you got here late because you had a flat tire. Yeah. Um, I have how how many gigabytes is it, Matt? Seven. Seven gigs. I have a seven gig video. Okay. Of the first eleven hours of the telethon. Right. If we give that to you today, yes. can you excerpt stuff from it? Sure. Because I tried and failed to excerpt well, things you, from you're it. You're not gonna be able to do that on a laptop. Yeah. Okay. I have to use my my video machine. All right. So yeah. Can you have us at least one excerpt before this this show airs live on Thursday? Well, what What do you want, Eugene Clark? Oh, he toward the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's yeah. about about seven minutes yeah, in you, length. You can tell me where about where it is, so I can find. Yeah, it. So, scroll through eleven hour. Oh, I can long. give you the exact time. Okay, stamps. yeah. If you give me the time because um, because yeah, Eugene, yeah, I figured we'd all go around. We could all list our favorite parts. Sure. Um, and I'll go last because uh, I'll try to hit things that the rest of you don't cover. Uh, but I want to say right up at the front, Eugene Clark. You know, of course, uh, former football player. Actor, everybody knows him as Big Daddy from Romero's Land of the Dead. Um, for me, he, his impromptu, unscripted, none of that was planned. That made the show for me. I thought it brought it, it all together. It brought beautifully together our eloquent. mission. It really was. It brought together what's going on in 2020. Um, so let's listen to that right now. And if you're hearing Dead Space here instead... It's because Dave was wrong. <laughs> I just want to point out, as always, 275 episodes, Matt gets praised. I, I'm still in trouble. So, <laughs> you know, someday I'll do something right. And I'll also point out that if there was dead space, I probably put something in there. <laughs> you know, you, you know, you put in the sounds of your arcade machine. Yeah. yeah. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, myself and Joe Ripple with Eugene Clark. You stick with me. Let's bring in Eugene Clark real quick. You know right. what? You, 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 you know stop. what, guys? I've been sitting here since like five thirty-five, and what I didn't know is you had to scroll down into your name and into the broadcast. I'm like, guys, I'm here. I'm right here. Hey, yo, I'm right here. <laughs> what? Then I, I looked and went, oh, I got to scroll down and enter the broadcast. You didn't tell me that. Come on, now you know I'm a zombie, baby. What's up? I blame you, Eugene. Eugene. How are hey, you, baby. friend? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How's the world treating you these days? Hey, brother, you know, staying safe, 
hand sanitizing, you know, I'm losing weight, you know, because I'm scared to go to the, to, the, to the grocery store. So, you know, I ain't eating people and nothing like that. I'm just eating vegetables and stuff. You know, oh, dang. Come on, people. Wear your mask and stuff. So instead of Big Daddy, we have to call you Big Cauliflower now? There you go. There you go. There you go. The first vegetarian zombie. The first vegetarian zombie. There you well, go. you notice in the movie, I never ate anybody. No, you didn't. You didn't. See? See? Yeah. See? I just had it wasn't for lack of trying. Well, that's true. That's true. That's true. Eugene, how are how are things how are things going? You know, I, I don't I don't want this pod this this I don't want to go too off track with right with everything that's going on because we want to focus on the families right. um, as things are moving on, but I just wanted to touch base with you as as an African American male and as an actor. Um, there's been this the hugest or the largest upswell um, ever since the passing of George Floyd, and I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um, obviously, you know, you've probably experienced things in your life that I can't imagine. And right. how did that? How does that? What's going on now? How does that impact you, and how does that make you feel? Well, I was born in the South. Yes, sir. Okay, so a long time ago. Don't let this smooth skin fool you. (laughs) So let me put it like this. We have a great country. I still believe we have one of the greatest countries in the world. We have to, we have to come together. It has to be with love. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to look at, um, it has to be that way. There are are things that bother me because there are things that generate explosions on one side. And I see stuff on the other side. You know, when I see Chicago and all these killings every weekend, I'm going, yo, come on now. It should be equal, equal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I remember... I remember <laughs> there are a lot of places I can't go on either side. And yes, when sir. I grew up, there are places I couldn't go on the white side. There are places I couldn't go on the black side. There are places I couldn't go on the Latino side. Okay? Yeah. So all I know is I've traveled a lot and all over the world, when there are no black people, when there are no white people, stuff is happening to people. So it's like, let's live up to what our constitution says. We are one of the greatest countries in America, I mean, in the world. And you know what? Love has to win out. You know, we can't. Okay, I play pro football. I played at Mm -hmm. UCLA. So what I see now is a bunch of teams taking sides, you know, and it's like getting hyped up over the mess. Every life in the world matters. But this country has to stay together, has to be cohesive. You know what I'm saying? We, we, We have to be able to... Because if we do a real history lesson, no one really can say much on either side. If we do a history lesson going way back, you know what I'm saying? But right now with the pandemic, it gives many of us an opportunity to to get a little insight into what um, the recipient of your 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 donations is, the some of the trauma they go through because they face they face issues every day. They face, yeah. many of them face life and death issues every day. I mean, I applaud, uh, why can't I think of his name right now? Uh, oh, Kane Hodder for asking you to include burn victims. See, they, they're going through atrocities on a daily basis. Yes, so sir. I really would like everyone to, you know, I know it's tough. I know, you know, Big Daddy's losing weight because I'm eating less because, you know what I mean? You got to pay the, he's like, pay the bill or eat the food. I'm going to pay the bill. So, but my mom always said, mama's baby, you know, you can afford to lose some weight. So, (laughs) you know, take some of that Starbucks money, take some of that candy bar money. You know what I mean? Uh, Give what you can. Even if, even if you're going to give five or $10, give it because that multiplies. But I, I honestly think that we need to be, we really I mean, so I know some people go, what? Lo-? Yeah, love. Yeah. When I hate, it destroys me. Yeah. When I forgive and go, you know what? We got to. I mean, 
we have a wonderful family on the um, convention tour. We do. We do. And you know it's, a, I mean? it's a family. It's a family where, you know, I feel comfortable if I take my nine year old daughter, she can run around the entire floor by herself and exactly. I don't have to worry about a thing. Exactly. You now, know? in all honesty, to answer your question, uh, when I'm traveling, there's a concern in my brain. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? I'm a military brat. And yeah. I was taught, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh, here's my thing. Here's my thing. Yep. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Because I have friends in L.A. who are, you know, I grew, when I grew up with black cops, white cops. And quite frankly, you you act bad. <laughs> they both going to get you. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Well, Eugene, I, I, I want to pop off here but and, and turn it back over to Brian. But uh, from the bottom of my heart, sir, thank you for coming on, spending a couple of minutes here, um, just sharing just sharing a little bit of love and a little bit of knowledge. Uh, I hope to see you back on the circuit real, real soon. Uh, and as usual, if you're not at our show, I'll swing by and make sure uh, make sure you see if you need anything to drink. Um, no, don't do that. You take care of us, baby. You do take care of us. I appreciate that. I, appreciate I, I certainly you. do try. And I appreciate okay, what I'm you're popping doing. I'm off, popping off and turning it back over to Brian. Love you, All sir. Right. Love you, brother. And Eugene, I got to tell you, you, you touched a lot of viewers, a lot of people in the chat. The chat blew up. Uh, people liked what you had to say. And as a result, we are now at $11,330. So thank you for that. Nice. My so, pleasure. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Echo what Joe said. I hope we see you next year, man. I hope so too, man. All right. You take care. Okay. So we're back. Hopefully people got to hear that again. <laughs> uh, it was, no, it, it was beautiful. So, so Dave. Yes. Let's start with you. What were your thoughts? What were your favorite moments? What didn't you like? Um, well, I, my first thought is, um, uh, Brian had me moderating the chat, which, first of all, thank you, everybody, for behaving. Um, it was a very tame chat. Yeah, it like, was. Nobody was being an ass. No, really. it was it yeah. was really good. Um, just based on my day, there is no way in hell I could have actually attended the convention because I was worn out just from sitting in my office and watching the chat all day. Right. Um, so I was actually happy with this version of Scares and Cares because I could participate – and and not be completely physically exhausted, um, right? Because I'm still recovering from my surgery and my cancer. So um, so that uh, I I told you when I was walking up the stairs here, but Brian, you did an amazing job. Um, I, these online things are not easy to do. I've been watching a lot of them over the last couple months, and most of them are terrible. This was not terrible. This was actually really good. Um, well, thank you. It was very professional. Um, obviously there's technical issues. It's called the internet. I'm telling you, when they get all the bugs worked out, this internet thing's gonna be amazing. <laughs> Anytime now. <laughs> this new fangled we're, internet. We're on the horizon. We're, we're, on, like, <laughs> right, we're so close. We're right there. That day will come. It's just yes. flawless. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's to be expected. And, you know, we're having a lot of storms. There's a hurricane, you know, and, and stuff. So people are going to lose power. And, you know, I, my internet went out for like 10 minutes or something at one point. But, um, no, it was it was fascinating. Like, even things that I didn't necessarily think I was going to be interested in. For example, the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, panel. Oh, that was uh, SX great. Guys, they yeah, were great. Yeah. That was great. Um, I didn't see like everything. I had to take a nap at one point because I was exhausted. Um, and it, you know, when I eat, should I, we shut that window, Matt? Do you think the cars are I'll, I'll are picking up? Yeah. Okay. So and when I eat, I think I've talked about this in the show. When I eat, a lot of times I have to lay down for like a half an hour after I eat to help the food move through my food tube system that I have now. Um, so I, I would take my phone into the bedroom with me and, and and listen on that and watch the chat from there. But um, I mean, Matt's panel was great. I love that. Um. The panel that Mary was on, the the thing about magic and stuff, that was fascinating. I love that one. I wish Bracken McLeod lived closer because I'd love to hang out and talk with him more. Oh yeah, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's so great. interesting. Um, I wish uh, Stephanie Whitovich lived closer because I think her and Mary in summer would become like bestest, bestest, bestest. We would become a coven. Is that what women say? Besties. 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 We'd be besties. Is that the term? Yeah. Bees. <laughs> like bees. So, um, and that was great. Um, geez, I'm trying to think now. Um. You know, oh, um, Strand and Kozanuski's reading starting it off. That was, yeah, that oh, was yeah. funny. It, they're so funny. I, <laughs> Kozanuski was doing an improv thing. I was almost crying. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> and scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said in the chat, I'm like, I'm going to go around the house for this day and say end scene and another crap out of TV. So, um, but that was awesome. The uh, Gabino and Cena, Cena, Cena Paleo. 
That was unbelievable. I had never seen Gabino read before. Holy crap, is he good. And she was amazing. Yeah. We were both. Oh, yeah. That reading was phenomenal. Uh, you know, I, I, there's a screen grab out there on Twitter. Yeah, I, I saw, saw it floating that. around of, yeah. of my expression, expression when yeah. Cena finished her yeah. story. Yeah. And you can see Gabino is like all pensive. Like, yeah. you, you, can, you can see it. He's like, Jesus, I hope Brian liked this. Yeah. No, it, and oh, yeah. you see my expression. And then there's a, a, a second screenshot of the two of them right. reacting to my reaction to their stories. That's actually one of my favorite moments. Yeah, no, but I'm was, sorry, Dave. Continue. No, it's okay. No, no, because that was really good. Um, you know, geez, I, I should have written stuff down, but, you know, that would require me to be organized. And, you know, I'm Matt. Like, Matt would have written stuff down. Yeah. I, I know. <laughs> Matt is God. I'm trash. I, I didn't write anything yeah. down. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Like you said, Matt, you actually did a really good job moderating that panel. Well, moderating a panel is a pain in the ass because usually nobody listens to you. And, you know, but because um, I've done it a couple of times. I did it once many years ago at San Diego Comic Con. Uh, back before that was ridiculous when it was more a comic convention. I feel like doing a live panel in person would be more difficult than it's like, yeah, it's, gotta, it's like hurting cats. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you, you did a great job. Your panel was really cool. Um, well, now, hurting cats is grind cast every week. Well, so. that's, <laughs> it's kind of like this. So, but the, uh, obviously I, I was very interested in the, uh, 45 year jaw, jaws anniversary, panel, yeah. which was great. Um, but, uh, the only thing I, I didn't like about it was that they didn't really talk about the soundtrack to the movie, which is, one of the best soundtracks yeah. ever. If only you knew somebody who was into shark movies and writes <laughs> music. And, um, I see where this is going, could, Mary. Could have, could have been on the panel to perhaps bring that to Oh, yeah, that's mm. right. That would have been me, the person from the podcast not permitted on the show in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I thought that hmm. you would I, I thought it would be too taxing for you. No, nah, I would have been right for an hour. No? <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. Well, Listen, I, I, I'm I figured, not a celebrity. <laughs> I figured, given the fact that Phoebe is going to dump you any day for Victor Laval. Yeah, well, uh, that, yeah, yeah, because this story that she that you would not want to be on the panel with Victor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, Phoebe, she, I, I have I'm to so ask, angry. why are you angry? Because I missed the Victor Laval panel. <laughs> I had my first day of class, and it's a it's an online class, and it runs from eight to twelve, eight a.m. in the morning to twelve noon. And I got through the class and it was great. And I'm like, okay, when's Victor Laval on? I'm like, 10 o'clock. I'm like, oh! oh. But I want to say to Victor Laval, I'm not a stalker. <laughs> and I want to let you know that I got your book, The Changeling, into my school's library. Woo! That's my legacy. I don't work for She says it so angry, though. I want to say to Victor Laval, <laughs> I'm not a stalker. <laughs> We, I don't know that we've mentioned this on the show, but we, I just pet your yeah. hair while you sleep. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. No. So I, I don't have think it's one lock. Yeah, to come up on the show. We talked about it online. She got fired from her job because of the the COVID thing. Right. She no longer works at the school. She's looking for a different type of job. But one of the things that will allow is she won't have her school schedule anymore, so she can go to Nikon next year where he's a guest of honor. Ooh. And I will be videotaping her first week <laughs> with Victor Laval. <laughs> It's 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 going to be amazing. But uh, back back to the topic. I just want to watch you eat. Uh, (laughs) Obviously, you guys keep this up. He's going to come out in like that Pope bubble. (laughs) Yeah, the Pope bubble. So he's taking his rider. Well, that's that's the reason why I was on the show because nobody would accept my rider. I heard the other day that Jason Momoa. The guy that was Cal Drogo on Game of Thrones. Uh-huh. His rider is that he must have. Oh, we know Jason Momoa. He must have, yeah, well, I'm sure you do. Oh, yeah, we do. He, he must have sliced meat and beer in, in his trailer at all times. I'm like, this is my new rider. Okay, wait. <laughs> wait. Yeah. There, question for, for Mary and Phoebe. Yeah. Mary, fuck, kill. Oh, God. Me, Jason Momoa, Victor Laval. <laughs> what, what fucking list is oh, this? Oh, my God. <laughs> I feel quite put on the spot. <laughs> I know. All right, think. Oh, 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 Phoebe's got her answer. <laughs> She's like, that was Mary, quick. fuck Victor, kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's hear it, Phoebe. Marry Victor Laval because I think he's a really good guy. Okay. Jason Momoa. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Ryan, your toes. <laughs> You know what? I can respect that. I can respect those choices. <laughs> to, to be honest, if you put my name in the studio, she would have said the same thing. So, except she would have led with that. I'm killing Dave. 
<laughs> and then she starts a 45 minute description of all the knife wounds she's going to get uh, me in the yeah. chainsaw. All right. See, all right, Tommy. I just, you know, like seriously. Pretend, pretend yeah. we're not a couple. Yeah. Okay. Pretend it's, it's a decade ago and you're just Mary San Giovanni and I'm Brian Keene. Pretend we just, this we has know each no other. repercussion so whatsoever. Just, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's Jason Momoa. She's leaning in. She's like, come on. Just it's, I know, but I gotta say, I, to be honest, to it's be Victor honest, Laval. From, from an ab- ab- Not me. aesthetic standpoint, I see why women find Jason Momoa attractive, but he, from an but I mean, he would. He he was never like on my list of celebrities that I. You so know. you're gonna kill him? Well, no. I figured maybe I'd marry him for Hold the financial on. security. Oh. So you're gonna kill me and f Victor? No, I was gonna. I was gonna f you because I've heard of your reputation twenty years ago. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Victor. I mean, I mean, you seem like a nice guy. I'll make it quick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Victor's wow. never going to want to beat this me now. <laughs> wow. See, this is this is why you should have had me on the show. <laughs> I, the other thing, too, is we, we talked about this. Um, obviously, one of the things that scares the carriers every year is Phoebe Unleashed. Right. And uh, I'm on a leash. We were going to come up here last week and get tomatoes from you. And she's like, when we go up, I'm going to do Phoebe Unleashed Quarantine Edition. And she was going to interview you guys. <laughs> we could still do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah come up next week. We'll do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, so, um, but uh, the thing, the two that I have to mention was the check presentation, oh my gosh. which uh, hearing the story that, and yeah. I, I'm terrible with names. Ashley and Natalia. Yeah, yeah uh, the, the story about the disease and all the stuff they go through. Um, <laughs> it was brutal. I, I'm not gonna lie. I was crying. Oh, I it yeah. it 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 really got to me. And to see how excited she was when she got that check, oh. it was it was like like I, I told her I said I didn't expect to be emotionally destroyed by scares the cares right. today, but it did. But that was an amazing moment. And like I said on Twitter, I, I, I had said this is why I, I support this charity because all the money goes to the people that need it. It doesn't go to administration and you know booze or whatever a lot of these charities spend money on. You know, if you look into charity, sometimes they're really terrible about how much money actually goes to who they're supposed to be helping. And like scares is like. Hundred percent, hundred percent. It's so so, and I, you know, just like everybody that came out and and volunteered, you know, to to be on the show. Thank you so much. And again, people in the chat, you guys were awesome, and you behaved. And well, you almost. Oh. Um, there was yeah. there, so was, there was a hiccup. There yeah. was well, we had we had one. I don't want to say the person was a comic skater. I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but right. their verbiage. Was quite similar to some members of Comicsgate right. who I dealt with. Dave never even saw him pop up. I yeah. dealt with it before anybody. Yeah, no, yeah. you were very Cause, cause that way. The, we shut down Brian Keene Radio so that Ultron could focus on the stream, um, which I'm glad we did because the the sick the internet needed that boost. Yeah. But but Ultron warned me. Oh, and I looked and I said, Oh, yep, I know who that is. Kill, yeah. and that. But Dungeon Master seventy seven point one. Oh yeah, in the chat as yes. Fire Lord HD, yes, yes, which, yes, so which is his YouTube channel. <laughs> yes, um, yes. he was having quite the time. Oh no, he was having a great time. I was laughing at him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was he cute. Was, he was entertaining. There, there was like, I, I think it was during my panel. There was a moment because I was like looking at chat every now and then, and like I think that's when we got like our first dislike. And he was like, "Who? Li- oh who yeah. Dis- oh yeah. 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 He, he was like, who disliked this? How can you not like this? It's a, it's a charity. It's a charity. The people are monsters." <laughs> That was hilarious. <laughs> People were like, "See internet, just it's all right, Dungeon yeah. Master, just call." I mean, so. it was so cute. Oh no, he, he was a little me in that moment. Oh, he yeah, was, he's, I, he's like, "I will rip your." Head off. <laughs> it was so cute. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, I, it was a great time. Like I said, you know, I I really enjoyed it, and you know, like I said, this is easily the best of these online convention things I've seen. And you got, you know, you really did a good job. I mean, because I know your technology is not your forte. Um, so, but it, it went perfectly. And I really like the thing too, but the questions came up on the screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see the questions. That was really cool. That's all. I, I wish I could take credit, but that's all, that's all stream yards. Yeah. Which, no, yeah. by the way, I'm glad that you showed me how to do that yeah. for, for Buzzbook. Right. So yeah. now I can, yeah. Buzzbook well, thing is coming up. Well, yeah, Mary, yeah. what about you? What, let's hear your thoughts on the, on the day. Okay. Um, Victor Laval. Well, first of all, first of all, um, <laughs> I, I want to mention like people can still donate, right? If oh, they yeah. still, okay. donate year round. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cause I text I, V care to nine one nine nine nine. That's V as in vampire care to nine one triple nine or 
If you don't trust the phone, go to scaresofcareweekend.com and click that big donate button. I have this memorized because I repeated it for 13 <laughs> yes, hours. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or V is in Victor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the stalker here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really liked uh, Kazanowski and, and Jeff Strand's reading. I, I think it's funny that they try to outdo each other. And like mm-hmm. the, the two of them are trying to be so serious while the other one's reading and you can see them like snickering and giggling in yeah, the background, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's really, it's really, it was, it was very funny. They're very funny guys. Um, I have to say, just as an aside too, I like that you call, uh, the second recipient a breast cancer warrior. Right. Because I feel that, I feel that like it's, it's somehow psychologically debilitating to be called like a, like a victim or even a survivor sometimes. Yeah. I like that, I like that you call them warriors because I think that is probably the most apt way to describe. I, I can't take credit for that. That was someone else on the board of directors. Actually, I'm not even sure who. Mm. Uh, that may have been Karen. Yeah. She was still with the sh- – or, or Greenwell. Someone else came up with that verbiage. I, uh, I like I agree. that. I like it. Yeah. I, I feel that it, it it's – you know, not to use an overused word, but I do feel that it, it empowers people that are, you know, that are generally fighting, you know, an illness. You know, I, it, it's – I like that. Um, I I told I told Brian last night that I I think my favorite panel was probably Matt's panel, the comic book panel, because I feel oh, that push off. no seriously <laughs> because I mean I I enjoyed I, I enjoyed a lot of a lot of the panels, but I felt that uh, for a topic I don't know a whole lot about, they made me interested in wanting to know about it. You know they they spoke with. Uh, you know, experience and authority and passion. And like, to me, that's what a panel should be. It should be a group of people who are there because they know their shit, you know, and, and they're excited about talking about it to other people and getting other people excited about it. And I think that's, that's how that panel came across to mm-hmm. me. Um, I, I have to say, I usually, I, I think maybe the first couple of years I went to scares, I did go to the costume contest and I did see, you know, presenting check the check, the check presentation. But when you're sitting way in the back, it's like watching, like you know, almost like little like video game people. And it's just like when you're in the back, and when you're in the back of anything, you know, <laughs> and you're a watching costume contest for ants. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I would actually go to that. <laughs> yeah, now you mentioned. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind, it of, cool. kind of cool, actually. Um, I don't think I ever saw up close how the like what we're doing for scares or the telethons or anything like that Mm -hmm. how it really affects the people we're raising the money for like you know it intellectually you know it's sort of you know uh but in in it but when you see it in a tangible way i mean she was so surprised and she was so moved and i mean you know i'm a single mom too i think uh, and and under the best circumstances when there isn't covid and when your child is perfectly healthy it's hard to be a single mom. Yeah. And I just, I feel like this woman is so incredibly strong and, and so, um, such a great mom, you know, to, to have taken this on pretty much alone and, 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 you know, is, is so loving. And that little girl, she's so cute and she's strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She is strong. I mean, she has, she has defied death several times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and kicked its ass. And I think just, just seeing, just seeing how, how moved she was receiving money that, that we helped raise. I was like, wow, maybe I'm not a horrible person. Maybe I've actually done some good in the world, you know? And it's, it it felt good. I think that was probably my favorite moment. Um, and, you know, just, I think just getting to see everybody that we don't get to see, you know, that we haven't been able to see all year and that, you know, even in good years, we only see maybe once a year. And, um, I, I was, it was, I, I, the whole thing I think was great. I, I was really proud of Brian. I thought he looked very sexy in his kilt. I did look very sexy in my kilt. <laughs> people in the chat said so too. They did. They did. <laughs> Not many people can pull the kilt off. That's true. That's true. You have, uh, you have, nice... I don't know that many people would want to see me pull the kilt off, man. <laughs> giggity, <laughs> giggity goo. Matt, what about you? Well, now with that in mind. <laughs> I would say marry Momoa, uh, fuck Victor, and kill myself. (laughs) 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 Mm. 
So, um, I, I really enjoyed, uh, Kaz and Strand. That was hilarious mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. to me. And like, before it all went down, he, Brian texted me and he's like, you know, hey, or no, you actually called me. I called you. And you're like, hey, this is what you need to know. Blah, blah, blah. It's just like running a podcast. I'm like, okay, that's fine. He's like, watch the first, uh, thing and you can get an idea. But I, I tuned in from the very beginning and it was just, I feel like that was such a really good way to start everything off because it broke the ice so yes, well. Yes, yeah, yes. The, the Joe Ripple. Yeah. The Joe Ripple doll in the chair. It was really- yeah. It, it just, like, it broke, because I'm sure everybody was sitting there thinking, like, you know, how do I how do I make this lively over the internet? Because, you know, people might not hear me. There might be delays in it. And just them doing it how they did it, it set everything it yes. sets the tone for the day. And everyone, I feel like after that, was able to just chill a little bit right. more. Right. You know, and they, they knocked it out of the park doing it straight off the front, you know. I'll, I'll say that. That was a really good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, I saw Steve. He, he was like, "Here, you could, the very fine house. Like, he had to show the book, you know. I'm just like, yeah, whatever you. <laughs> so you don't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. I love him. I, we've been we've been yelling back and forth to each other on Twitter about cooking lately because yeah. he, he gets all these boxes every month and he said, now that I get these, I'm a better chef than Matt Wilderson. And I was like, oh, <gasps> those are some fighting words. Wow. <laughs> yeah. After COVID cook off. <laughs> but I, 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 Steve, I, I will uh, I'll hold back one of our private conversations. You asked me about how to prepare a certain dish. I'll just leave that. Oh, alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess. Microwave popcorn. <laughs> no, he's, he's better than that. He's better than that. But okay. yeah, um, I enjoyed that a lot. I really did enjoy the Jaws panel because um, I really love Jaws the movie. Mm, like, okay. and I know a lot of people, and that's, that's funny. Like, I hear sometimes people like, well, how, what, what's so great about Jaws, really? It's just a, another, sh- and, and in this day and age, there's so many goddamn shark movies that are just absolute trash mm-hmm. that it stains that yeah. genre, really. And people just hear shark movie, even if it was the best ever made, they, it still has that dichotomy attached to it. But I'm like, they hit a lot of really good points. Like Dave said, though, they didn't really talk much about music. And I was like, <clears> that. <throat> dun, dun, dun. Right. I'm like, how? It's just <laughs> iconic, really. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's been used in everything. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I love that movie so much. And like, they, they dabbled some talking about some of the not so great sequels. I, if I was on that panel, I would have been like, okay, we all, we all have stroked Jaws's dick enough. <laughs> Let's talk about Jaws 3D, shall we? <laughs> That's a whole panel right there. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> well, I believe Victor Laval said uh, one of his favorite scenes of any Jaws movie was from Jaws Four. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Four. And I, I'm with him on that. <laughs> I am with him on. I'm that. I'm not even sure I've seen Jaws Four. I didn't know there was. Oh my Jaws god, 4. Four is such a goofy movie. They literally move to like a different area of the country, and the shark just follows them. <laughs> There's an angry, <laughs> vengeful shark. Yeah. Right it's there. like it can just sense the Brody pheromones. In there. <laughs> it just follows them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, the check presentation, like everybody's. I'm, I'm, I feel like we keep talking about the same things, but these literally are, I think, some of the best moments. Like, and I, I don't, because I've never been to other scares that cares, and I'm just going to assume you guys don't normally get to see the check presented. To whoever oh, you yeah, yeah, it's usually, okay. Okay. It's it's usually right. during the, the yeah. costume contest, which a lot of us don't go to. And I was trying to figure out why. It's, it's in an auditorium right. that seats like 2,000 people. Oh, yeah. So usually okay. I think we bail to give other only, people. Yeah. And the, the celebrity guests often don't go so that attendees can right. actually okay. get in there right. and see it. Well, that, I feel though this was way more personal then, yes. than that yeah. was. And that, and that just added like a different level to it. And – I, I like Dave said, and you as well. Like when that moment hit, where she like sees the check, and like, and you see like Joe's tearing up, and you're tearing yeah. up, and she just loses it too. And you like, you can't if you didn't cry at all. I you, your right. human card has to be yeah. pulled. I'm serious. <laughs> like, and even like the picture that was put up on Twitter at that moment, I was like, that that was a perfect capture because it was like everybody at the same time. Like you could just see how much this meant. Yeah, and you know. We talk about Jaws during it. We talk about comics. We talk about like how you know far horror can go. Can it go too far? You know that right. was a good. That panel was a good too. panel oh, that too. That was yeah. good too. Yeah. Especially uh, Wrath was extra entertaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 was a very well received panel. Yeah. Actually. Yes. Yeah. I, by the way, yeah. it, it, the whole thing is up on YouTube, right? No. Uh-huh. Um. 
and that's my fault. Uh, StreamYard, I found out, only records the first 10 hours. Okay. Ah, okay. So what happened is at the end of, I guess, 11 hours, or, or StreamYard only records like the no, you're first, right. like the first el- 11, 10, 10 or 11 hours. hours. Yeah. Anyway, I've got the whole first 10 hours mm-hmm. on video. Right. That's what we're going to give to you to excerpt down. Right. But if you go on YouTube now and click the live stream, it only shows the last three hours. So it starts in the middle of the Bizarro panel. Uh, okay. You get to see the check mm-hmm. presentation. Okay. You get to see uh, At least you the costume see contest. Mm-hmm. Amelia Kincaid's interview, mm-hmm. Rio and, and Malfi. But you don't get to see the 10 hours before that. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put up each segment. Like – Here's oh, sure. Chef Strand and Stephen yeah. Kosniewski. Here's this. Here's mm-hmm. that. Over the next few weeks. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, th- those those moments to me were some of the best. And I did enjoy the the you know how far can horror go? Pan- yeah. Like, can it go too far? I, I did enjoy that because that's a question I think a lot of people ask. Like, how far do you go until you lose an audience? Right. You know? mm-hmm. Right. And and the panel for that was perfect. I, yeah. I think. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. But well, I will. Uh, I will touch on some, because Matt said we're all hitting the same ones. I will try to touch on some different ones. Um, and it wasn't planned. It's just, I'm surprised I have some different ones. I mean, obviously the check presentation. Right. Of yeah. course. And seeing all of our friends. Um, but my guys, Dakota Lawrence and, and, I was going to say, yes. Taylor, I was just yeah, going to yeah. say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he is so delightful. Pruitt, uh, Taylor, like he's just, Everything about him is just very cherub. Like you just want to hug him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cherub. I mean, he's a little cherub. I love it. <laughs> you know, Pruitt. He's not only one of my favorite actors. He's one of my favorite people. And just you know, the the I don't know if people watching picked it up, but the you know he his delight as soon as we're on screen to go, hey Brian, you yeah. know, and and I I love Pruitt and D- Dakota both. They are a fucking riot. Dave, I know you and Coop like to joke about filming me for a reality show. I'm telling you, the reality show no, so is, is Pruitt and Dakota on a cross country trip. I, I don't remember if I typed it in a chat and I'm like, I need to follow these two around with a camera 24 oh, yeah. seconds. Need a greatest TV show ever. Yeah. Just the stories they were telling. That story about the stripper, that was amazing. <laughs> stripper fall down, go boom. Stripper fall down, boom. I lost it. You know, yeah. it, I want to make sure people understand. We have a lot of actors that scares the care. We we have actors on this show. No one other than one who I'm going to mention here. Well, no, not it's not an either or. Both of them, but one of them is Pruitt. Pruitt uh, does so much for our show, and he's so supportive of the charity. And uh, yeah, I, I hope folks will support him. And the other actor who does that, John Anderson. Oh, yeah. oh, he's you know, great. He really is awesome. I love John. Um, I think, John, this is the first you're going to hear about it, but I am going to RSVP. Mary and I decided we just, we can't make the wedding next month. We can't do it safely. It makes us very sad. It, but- being there is okay. It's the traveling from here to there and the lodging. Uh, but yeah. I love John. Um, I wish John lived closer because he's like the kind of guy that, you just want to hang out and giggle with, you know? If John lived closer, we would see them every night. Cause, yeah. Because he and I would be just getting, <laughs> getting high up to and quote, Beavis and Butthead <laughs> together. I, you know, I, um, you know, so yeah, uh, Pruitt, Taylor, Vance, John Anderson, I, I like both their segments. John Wayne Communale. Yes. Um, that was yeah, his song I was, was fun. I was not expecting the song. That was a complete surprise. Mary said, uh, watching me and him is like watching me interview me from 20 years yeah, ago. It is. Yeah, so, it is. So, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah. I, I, I thought about it. I said, yeah. yeah. I, I said, I wouldn't have done the song, but I, I would have done something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I um, love when he first popped in in the the Jason thing and he had smoke. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> Yep. Well, I told him. I said, "You're you're the lead in to the horror for kids panel." I said, "I said, <laughs> of course." You no you, I said, "You can't be ripping bong hits <laughs> when I bring you on the air." You know, I told Christian Christian Jensen was supposed to be on f- with Felissa Rose. Right, Felissa Rose. We we're not sure what happened there. It might have been technical issues, but so I, I bring Christian on by himself. But I told him beforehand. I'm like, "Do you promise me you can keep it G rated?" Promise me you can keep it G-rated. Oh, I'll do it. Well, of course, ten hours before that, 
the very first segment of the stream, Joe Ripple takes it to oh, Rated yeah. R right away. So, <laughs> but, uh, but to Christian Jensen's credit, he did, he did keep it pretty G-rated. Yeah, he did. He did. He yeah, did he, did. he did. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, we mentioned Gabino and Cena's reading and, and all – all credit to Strand and Kozanowski. They yes. were wonderful. And I am always going to team the two of them together. Oh, yeah. But Gabino yes. and Cena, holy shit. Just holy shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Lar Park Lincoln um, from Knott's Landing, Friday mm-hmm. the 13th. Uh, she joined us briefly. Um, she was very I sweet. really mm-hmm. liked her segment. People, I, you know, she brought it up. I wasn't sure if she wanted to talk about it public or not. But she's fought breast cancer multiple mm-hmm. times. And she's still, you know, still standing strong. Uh, so yeah, all in all, just a great, great show. Yeah. Uh, despite the technical hiccups, um, unfortunately, we did get some bad news, uh, after the fundraiser yeah. edit ended. Uh, Jose Castillo, uh, listeners know him as the guitarist for Discipline Theory. He was a longtime listener to this show, a big supporter of us, big supporter of Scares. Um, he was rushed to the hospital shortly after the live stream ended. Uh, he was unresponsive. His brothers, his nephews, and first responders all tried to revive him. Uh, but he passed away later that night at the age of 42. Um, we reached out to lead singer Eddie C., also a longtime listener, big supporter. Uh, you know, Eddie has started a GoFundMe. Uh, they're raising money to help pay for Jose's funeral arrangements and his medical bills. Um, I can't remember if we had talked about this on the air or not, Dave, but he, uh, back in May, he got a blood clot in his lung. It was almost fatal. Uh, he had recovered. He was able to come home, but he was not able to get health insurance because of a government error. Um, and he was not able to get the proper treatment and the meds he needed. Uh, he was in the middle of trying to get insurance to cover his bills for May when this happened. Uh, So they're, you know, they're raising money for this, for his funeral, for those medical bills. Um, You know, I, it's important to note, I don't know if they want this made public or not, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Jose lived at home with his younger brother. Okay. And the reason they were doing that is because the two of them were taking care of their older autistic brother and their elderly mother. Okay. So now his younger brother is left alone. Oh, man. Caring for the mother, Aww. caring for their older autistic brother, and trying to take care of his brother's funeral right. and take care of that debt. Okay. Uh, so go to GoFundMe, type in Jose Castillo Funeral and More, or just check Twitter feed. I've got the link up there. They need 15000 Uh As of this recording, they're up to 7000 Oh, good. That's um, good. And That's after good. this show airs, I'm sure we'll get them over the amount they need. Yeah. They, uh, he was he was such a sweet guy. Like, they, uh, like both the, all, the, the, all of Discipline Theory, they were great. But, you know, talented, sweet, you know, just whatever you can do, guys. Well, you yeah. know, it's heartbreaking. You know, I, yeah. I talked to Eddie last night, and I was shocked. Because, you know, Mary, you, you told me this the morning after. The, yeah. the the stream and I had seen Eddie and Jose both in the stream. You know they were in the chat, Dave. I'm sure you saw them yeah, in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I talked to Eddie. Uh, he told me they were in fact watching the stream. Here's what got me: Jose's last monetary spending before oh, no. he died was to make a donation to Scare the Care. During that, he makes a donation oh. during the live stream, and then he fucking dies. Um. Eddie also told me uh, that Jose had told him he was at peace with whatever happens. Um, he wanted me to know that he got himself a flying V guitar after he played mine. <laughs> nice, nice. Awesome. I'm sure his was tuned. Yeah. And he could As I told Mary, an actual rock guitarist went out and bought a guitar. I still haven't learned how to play mine, but um, and very important. Excuse me, I'm trying not to choke up. Eddie told me uh, Jose did f- finish recording his guitar tracks for the next oh, Discipline Theory oh. album. Uh, <laughs> so they, they will be able to put out that last bit. I told him, you know, I get that. I've been doing that with Jesus' stuff. Uh, so, yeah, Eddie, man, we fucking love you. We loved Jose. Uh, you know, um, longtime listeners who attended our second 
annual telethon back on May 11th of 2016, back when people were still saying, oh, he's going to get tired of doing this any time now. Um, if you were there in person, I broke Dave. Like, <laughs> so many things I could say. I'm going to be here. Well, that was May 11th, 2016. If you were there in person, then you met Jose. He was there. Mm -hmm. uh, Discipline Theory played that show. Scott Edelman uh, has some footage of that up on his YouTube channel. Um, but Dave, I thought maybe we could play one song, just one song by Discipline Theory as a, as a tribute to Jose mm -hmm. as well. Can we do that? Yeah, I have them all. Okay. So. All right. So let's pause for a moment and listen to that. This first song is off of our first EP we put out a few years back. This one's called Broken. <laughs> So there you go. Jose Castillo, friend of the show, guitarist of, of Discipline Theory, uh, ne uh, uncle, brother, son. Uh, friend. Friend, gone at 42. Uh, again, that GoFundMe, just go to GoFundMe and type in Jose Castillo, C-A-S-T-I-L-L-O, funeral, and it should pop up. So, um, 
You know, they just just for the record, I don't know if they know this, but like it had been on my my bucket list of things like that I'd always wanted to do, but never thought I'd be able to do would be to like about Peter Steele's microphone. Well, no, it would be to sing with a band. Oh, yeah. And they let me do that. And it just it, it meant a lot because like if I had not been a writer, the only other well, there were only other two other two career choices I had had in mind other than being a writer. And one of them was being a homicide detective, which I think I would have been pretty good at. Right? Thank you. Thank you. And, and the other one was, was to be a singer in a rock band. Yeah. Well, and not well you, had that, you had that quick stint with Rush there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and not only, not, only did you get, cruel. not only did you get to sing with a rock band, but you, you're a big Typo Negative fan. Yeah. And the microphone they had belonged to Peter Steele from Typo Negative. I, oh, that's I got, awesome. I got to touch it. <laughs> I got to touch the big microphone. <laughs> All right, F. Mary Kill, Peter Steele, <laughs> Jason Momoa, Dave Thomas. <laughs> now Mary's going to move into her homicide career. All right. Me. One more note of news, and then we'll get to uh, to Daniel Krauss. Uh, someone else who passed away the night of the stream was Wilford Brimley. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. He was 85 years old. I only got to meet him once. Uh, he was a very nice guy. I was amazed by his sense of humor because he often played very gruff. Yeah, very grumpy Even guy. when he's yeah. selling oatmeal. It's like he's <laughs> and, hollering And at diabetes him. medicine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I asked him at a, at a, at a con, uh, you know, it was, it was off hours. And I said, did you ever see Family Guy's bits with you? And Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he laughed about it. He he likes the one when Wilford Brimley goes to the Teen Choice Awards and, <laughs> and just starts shotgunning the audience. <laughs> like he 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 laughed about that. Oh, nice. So I nice. thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, he passed away. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we can or cannot confirm his last words may have been "Watch Clark <laughs> and watch him close." Do you hear me? <laughs> oh, that was that's that, still my favorite. That's what I always know him as is Blair. From, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean. The the eulogies in entertainment, they're all talking about, you know, diabetes and Quaker Oats and yeah. uh, Which is just heartbreaking. What was what was that family always, show? Yeah. Our house or something. Oh. Oh. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't think of the name. But of it, you know, yeah. yeah, he's always gonna be Blair. From yes. The yeah, for me. Yes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And yeah. he I really believe he delivered probably one of the creepiest lines, which is watch Clark. Yeah, I mean, the, it, 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 in the in the context of the movie, it is well, probably also, the, the creepiest line. I also love that part where he's trying to convince them to let him out, and there's a noose hanging. In yes, the, yeah. he's like, "I'm fine. I'm now. fine. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Open the door. Open the door. Yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> the debate, of course, is was he infected by that point? I don't know. Nobody uh, will know. I'll, I'll tell you what the theories say. That the <clears throat> common canon theory said that he was infected shortly after they put him in there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go. Speaking of infection, let's talk about <laughs> the, living, segue. the Living Dead by George Romero and Daniel Krause, and then we will catch you folks on the flip side. Okay. Joining me now is the Bram Stoker Award-nominated, Odyssey Award-winning, and New York Times best-selling author of Rotters, one of my favorite zombie novels that you people have heard me rave about many times before on this show, as well as Blood Sugar, Bent Heavens, The Death and Life of Zebulon Finch, and with Guillermo del Toro, Troll Hunters, and The Shape of Water, his latest novel, The Living Dead, is a posthumous collaboration with our friend George Romero. Welcome to the show, Daniel Krause. Hey, man, I am psyched to be here. Thanks. I'm psyched to have you here, brother. Uh, we had We had hoped, of course, before the pandemic, Early this year, we had talked about doing this in person, but yeah, I, I'm yeah. glad we get to do it regardless. Um, I feel like you've been on the biggest press tour of your career. Is is that a correct assumption? It, it, you know, with Shape of Water, it was it was bigger, but in a different kind of way because it was mostly focused on the movie. You know, the the, the book and the movie came out more or less simultaneously. Uh, so in a sense, uh. That was bigger, but when the, when they're flying you first class to the Venice Film Festival and stuff, that has nothing to do with books. That ain't book money. <laughs> uh, so I would say, yeah, if you're just talking about uh, a book alone, definitely, definitely, it's been, it, you know, it's a it's a high interest right. project inherently. Well, I appreciate you taking some time with us, man. Oh, are you kidding um, me? I mean, this is like the 
I've become the loyalist of loyal listeners. And I, you know, who knows what is on this episode of the show before the interview, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, I know you don't want to, you know, immediately get down to the muck, but I think what you guys have done on the show as of late dealing with all the controversies and everything has been moving in a way. Like it's been tremendously courageous and uh, inspiring. Uh, and I think it's, it's an important, important thing that you guys have done. And uh, I wish that podcasts were more searchable, you know, like, like there were a, like a text version because there's so much important news that you guys have covered um, that I wish was more accessible uh, in a, on a searchable basis, you know? I agree. You know, I, I toy with the idea of doing transcripts every week, but, you know, I, I Creatively, I'm like you. I always yeah. have more than one thing going at a time. And I, I just I don't have time to sit there and no. type up a transcript every week. No, no. I mean there's there's a service I used to use called Rev that was relatively affordable transcripts that would come back um pretty quickly. But I mean that needs to be paid by some other entity. You can't be dishing that out for very long podcasts every week. Right. But I mean listen, we don't need to talk about transcribing uh shows but i do want to just communicate to the host just how much i mean i think you have it with sense without me talking about it how much it means to people uh to have to have essentially leaders you know to uh inspire us all to to fight for what's right as cheesy as that sounds well, and it's it's it. meant a lot to me personally really well that means a lot to me any anytime somebody um who's respected praises our show that's a good thing <laughs> yeah all right i'm respected for now anyway <laughs> well you know let's let's talk about the living dead um you know you told entertainment weekly that that george romero is the reason you're a writer he might be the interest the reason you're interested in art period yeah um i mean you know i'm sure influence wise you had the same influences as all the rest of us our age but mm -hmm. uh you know George was your main inspiration. Yeah. What do you think it was about not just his zombie movies, but yeah. but his entire body of work? What about it spoke to you, do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, part of it is that it is started so much earlier. So when you're talking about influences, you're probably talking about Stephen King and, and uh, people like that. But, you know, my influence with Romero was so much earlier. I'm talking five or six years old. You know, Your it mom was, showed you a night of yeah, yeah. Death, right? So R Romero was my Star Wars. You know, it was something. It was like the the playground of my imagination. You know, That's I mean, awesome. I, I had I had some Star Wars toys too, and they didn't really make uh, Night of the Living Dead toys, but they, if had they, I would have had them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's his influence is that of a parental figure almost because it came yeah. so young, um, and I think. For a kid to get, and it was it was Romero and Rod Serling because my mom loved both of those uh, people and I saw a lot of both of them. And I I think when you latch on to people like Romero and Serling uh, at a young age, I think it might do something to you because it's not it's not it's not He Man, you know. It's something that has a uh, a strong moral compass to it and uh, a real interest in. Uh, progressive thought and social justice, both of those guys. Um, and it inevitably, it does something to you and it changes you. And I think particularly with, you know, Rod and George, you start at a young age rooting for the the little guy, you know, and, and pulling for the underdog. And that becomes part of your worldview, even before, you know, you have influences. Right. Yeah. I, I can, I can definitely definitely see that and i see it echoing throughout your work even like your you know your ya stuff and, and you know it, it's it's there um so night of the living dead was your first now yeah. are you are you seeing dawn and day as a kid too or did they come along later they, they came along later so obviously if you listen to the show you know all about don's copy or night of the living dead's copyright problems so for years, it was just night. So night, yeah. night is on TV all the time. Uh, not just Halloween, but it's 
it's just on constantly. So I get to see it dozens and dozens of times going up. Black and white version, the Hal Roach colorized version, right? Uh, edited versions, you name it. <laughs> v- versions with horror hosts and versions without. Uh, so for years, that was it. it you know, because this was, I mean, you know, this was eight, early 80s. So, right. you know, for a while there, that would have been even before we had a VCR. So yeah. I'm watching just whatever comes on TV. And 25% of the time, that's <laughs> Night Living Dead. Uh, so I don't, the next Romero film that I, uh, saw was Day of the Dead, actually. Day of the Dead. Um, so that was quite a leap as far as, you know, the visceral grotesque, grotesqueness of it, you know? Right. Uh, and I remember I had a friend as a little kid who had a much older brother, like in high school, high school age brother. And he was just one of those kids I remember being really scared of, you know, he carried around a switchblade and he had... Uh, heavy metal posters up in his room and then i was you know i was probably eight years old or something he scared the shit out of me and every anytime we walked through the living room or something he was watching horror movies he'd have on texas jane's i'm asking her day of the dead in this one case and you know it was i was afraid to walk through that living room because i didn't know what the fuck (laughs) i was gonna see on that tv screen Uh, and some of that shit really uh scared me and you know and those old VCRs and VHS tapes and TV, you know, cathode ray TVs, yeah. like you couldn't even make out half of what was going on. And that almost made it scarier because it was just like you just heard screaming and uh, sort of shiny blood. <laughs> anyway, so I, I glimpsed uh, Day of the Dead. It was a bub scene, you know, where they're feeding him uh, right. blood, bloody innards out of a bucket and I was just like freaked out. Um, and I, and I think I saw, I saw uh, bits of Day of the Dead a couple times before I watched the whole thing. And to this day, after Night, which I don't, I can't even really, Night's more like an album to me, like it's a music that is just in my life. So I can't even oh, really. Yeah. It's, it's Dark Side of the Moon. It's Rubber Soul. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. So I can't even realistically judge Night. But, but beyond night, my favorite one, my favorite of Romero's films is, is still day. Um, so, and then probably the other one I would mention is again, a friend who I was probably a little bit older, a friend had HBO. We didn't have HBO, but I was at his house and, um, a creep show was on. Right. And it was the, uh, the bloodiest scene in the movie where, uh, the, uh, the, the monster under the stairs in the cellar attacks Adrian Barbeau and there's, you know, just the, the light goes red. So it's red on red and just more blood than I'd ever seen in my life. So, you know, it's just your kind of standard story really of just being one of those people who uh, heads toward that stuff. Right. Like, like I think for a lot of us, th- there's two kind of people, there's two kinds of people, right? The something scary happens in your youth and you back away from it. Right. And then there's the other type where something scary happened. Then maybe you back away from it initially, but you're so intrigued by why, by your own reaction to it. Yeah. You know? And you want it again. You want to know more. You know? Yeah. So I kept back. You know, I remember being really little and being scared about something under my bed and I'd crawl under there, you know, <laughs> just to like make myself do it. I don't know what I was thinking, but it's just this instinct to do exactly what I know is going to make me physically ill, even thinking right. about. So I wonder, do, do you still have contact with your, your buddy from childhood who had that older brother? No, I, no. not at all. I, you, say, you, you know, <laughs> you almost wonder if the older brother is out there and he's bald now and he's got the belly and he sees your name yeah. on the cover with George Romero. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that's a uh, probably a more realistic idea than what just flashed in my head, which was, you know, he's a he's a serial killer, and he's, <laughs> which isn't fair at all. He's probably a normal dude, uh, but I still have that instinctive uh, fear of him. I don't even remember his name. Yeah, uh, and I don't think I haven't even thought about him until this interview. Uh, um, <laughs> but yeah, he and he used to he used to draw. He was a great artist, but he would right. draw horrible things like i remember on his bedroom door was this uh sketch of a fork through an eyeball right uh and i just i mean remember that so vividly like who is this maniac that's just around the corner from where we're playing with our toys 
<laughs> oh man. Now I um you got to meet George in two thousand five, two thousand six, something like that. Yeah, I mean I only met him once, you right. know. Like uh and it was just a social visit, you know. Right. Uh I I had I knew his manager and his manager was in Chicago and said, Hey, I'll come up and hang out with George for a little bit. Right. Um and that's what we did. Uh you know, you know, one of the interesting, I don't know if it's interesting or not, but, you know, g- flashing back for a second to the start of our conversation, when I was talking, when I was praising you for the show and how it handles um, all these issues, I'm always shocked by how many of the controversies come out of conventions. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and I, I, as some listeners may realize, I almost never go to them. Uh, yeah. I've, I've spent my entire career not going to any. Um. I think when I when I met you at StokerCon a year or two ago, yeah. that, I mean, that might be probably the first horror convention I've ever gone to. It was the first time I'd met you. Like, yeah, I, I just, I've, I had, you know, until a few years ago, I had a very demanding full-time job. And I wrote like a maniac all weekends and um, on, on all my holidays and, and vacation. And so I just never built in time to do anything but write. Yeah. Anyway, the reason I bring this up is that when I met George, it was at a uh, horror convention. Right. Um, but I only went to the uh, hotel room and hung out with him there. So, yeah, unlike, you know, I'm sure yourself and a lot of other people, I, I knew him even less as a person. You know, I, although he was a father figure to me, I'd only met him one time. Well, that's that's what I was curious about. I mean, you know, I the first time I met George, it was it was probably very similar to your experience you know it was chris rowe and and mm-hmm. greg nicotero and they're like you know we're at a party at a, yeah. at a convention and they're like hey you want to meet george and you know he's across the room i'm like no no we can't bother george now nah, come on you're gonna go meet george but then after that i would see him all the time on the convention yeah. circle. and you know you you get to talking every time but i remember that initial meeting how very welcoming and down to earth he was and I mean, I'm sure you had that same experience, but I'm wondering, did you get a chance to tell him what his work meant to you or did you did you play it cool and say, oh, no, I'll, I'll tell him next time? I, I think it was mostly playing it cool. Yeah, yeah, we didn't we didn't really talk about that kind of stuff. We talked about, uh, you know, just like stories from childhood or growing up, you know, like we didn't really even talk about horror or movies or at all it was just more general stuff but you're right he was you know he was extremely uh generous and kind and i mean and that was part of it you know the why it was so nice is because we didn't talk about that stuff you know um and that's and what and do do i regret in retrospect no i don't because it wouldn't have meant that much to him i don't think you know i would just have been another person saying that to him so why not just have a pleasant a pleasant time yeah, I mean, I can tell as somebody who's literally, you know, signed across from him, I don't know how many times and how many conventions he he and probably Stephen King and and, you know, Don Coscarelli and, and others, they they hear that. Yeah. All day long. And it means something, but they hear it all day long. Yeah. You know? And so and so taking the time, especially if you're in a social situation to to bring that up and to kind of get into that, it's, it's more about you. Exactly. It's more about, cause you want to get this kind of weight off your back. Yep. So I just kept the weight on myself. Uh, and so, no, I don't regret it. Um, but I certainly regret not, uh, having him around, you know, I would give anything to be able yeah. to, to, to show him this book, uh, to, you know, ideally it would have been an earlier draft of the book so you could comment on it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, I'm surprised. I don't know that I've never missed, uh, an artist like I miss George. Yeah. Like I've, I've never known a famous person who is, or a artist that has affected me who's died. It, I've never, it's never been anything like this. Uh, and then I felt that before, of course, there was only a month between when he died and when I, I got the call to start working on the book. Right. But in that month I was, you know, I was down, I was morose and I, and I've never experienced that before. And I don't know that I'll experience it again. I, I absolutely, I get that. And you know, you're not the first person 
impacted by George's work or who's worked with George has said that on the show. Uh, Matt Blasey said the same thing on this show. Uh, director George Demick, who worked with George early in his career, they they all said very similar things. You know, um, I, I think that was part of his magic. Yeah. You know? But you mentioned getting the call. Let's talk about that. So George worked on this from what I've heard a little over a decade. Um, yeah, I think it's know, accurate. Okay. And you know, he, unfortunately he passes away before he finishes the book. So at some point, Chris and, and Suzanne, they decide to shop the unfinished manuscript. Um, you know, they wanted somebody who wasn't necessarily a, a zombie fanatic, a zombie, you know, they, they wanted somebody that appreciated his entire body of work. And in my opinion, they picked the right person for that, but, how, how how did that go down? Like you get the initial call and did you yeah. think you were being punk? Did you think Ashton Kutcher was going to jump? <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, it, I did. Yeah, it was, it was a stunning call. Uh, you know, I heard Chris's, I heard Chris's voice on the phone. Um, I hadn't spoken to him since that time I met George. So a good yeah. decade or so uh, had passed. Um, and, uh, you know, my, I'm sure a thought went off in my head. I was like, Oh, I wonder if this has anything to do with George having passed a month ago. Right. Um, and then he sort of says, hello. And I, I, I sort of remember saying, Hey, I'm so, so sorry about George. I know you guys were very close. And he says, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, Susan, and I have been going through some of his, uh, unfinished work. And so, and I think even then, immediately something sparked in my brain because I, every once in a while over the previous decade, he would mention in an interview that he was working on a book. Oh, yeah. uh, so it wasn't like it was, it wasn't talked about a lot, but it it was known. Right. So I think even before he said it, I was like, "Holy shit, is this about this that book that he was supposedly writing?" And it was. Um, and I was just kind of blown away and of course you know how, how chris and Sue's were approaching it was more like would you be interested you know right. uh in taking a look at it and considering doing it uh this time i did not play it cool uh this time i said yes yes i am very interested right um and then all the 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 self-doubt and uh, pressure and all that stuff would come later uh but Immediately, it was I was a fish on a line, you know. I was like, yes, yes, absolutely. And it was the feeling of, you know, how could you say anything else? It's like it's like being in a minor league baseball and getting a call right. from the majors, right? It's like you, you, of course, you say yes. It doesn't matter how nervous you are, how ready you think you are, you say yes. It's what you train for, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I in thinking about, I mean, you know, you'd worked with Galermo by this point, and you you'd had some pretty good successes but but yeah this is george romero i mean this is this is your number one so yeah. so I, I i i can't imagine the the swirl of emotions that went through you they, well you, they, you know but you know how these things work right Cause, because they're not they don't happen immediately there's right. the question of uh uh you want it to be this kind of like i won the lottery moment but it's 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 really yep. months of talking back and forth and getting the manuscript and doing a proposal and then getting it with the agent and then sending out the publisher. So it's really this long drawn out process that oh, is yeah. very yeah. anticlimactic, really. Yeah. I'm, I, I cannot talk about it on the air. Uh, but you know, Mary and a couple others close to me can vouch. I've been going through something very similar this year. Uh, the person has not passed away, but the, person wants me to play in their world so to speak and cool. uh it's just a matter of timing and finding the right venue for it and uh i want to yeah i want that it to me it is winning that lottery moment but i'd like to actually get the cash in my hands yeah, right <laughs> yeah there's a lot of other steps that uh that, that that aren't that lottery moment at all they're they're filled with uh anxiety and and doubt and just questioning whether this is really going to happen, you know, because right. there's always a million hurdles you don't expect. Right. So you, you know, eventually it does happen. You get the cash in hand, so to speak. You get the, the unfinished manuscript. Um, 
I mean, talk about that a little bit. You know, I, I know that you got it in pieces. You got like, yeah. he had finished like a third of the book. Yep. Uh, but there were some parts that needed fleshed out. And, but you didn't get it all at once. Yeah. That was one of the the most, boy, it was both the coolest part of the, of the collaboration and the worst part. Uh, the most inconvenient pain in the ass part. Uh, so but yeah, so basically there was a manuscript. Uh, and then, so I, I, you know, we can talk about my research, but I spend months researching various things, um, right. both technical stuff for the book. And then just a lot about George and his theories and philosophies and stuff. Uh, so I start working on the book. It's a it's a it's a 650 page book, so it's a long book. So I I'm I'm working for a while on it, and then we uh, the short version is we un- we uncover a hundred pages that he had written of a earlier attempt at a similar book. So around yeah. the year 2000, he had uh, he had made a run that in some ways was sort of similar. Certainly thematically, it was similar but was uh, very different in characters and stuff. Uh, and uh, I, I, we, I sort of helped in the rediscovery of it and got permission to use it. Um, and, you know, well, first of all, it was breathtakingly great. Like it was really, really cool stuff. Uh, the challenge at that point was, well, really at any point it would have been, how do I make these two different things work together? Because the excitement for me was, all right, so he had, these are two different stabs at the book, but they're, they're similar enough and they follow the the same trajectory that, you know, these pages are precious and I want to incorporate them. And Sue's wanted to incorporate them. Right. Uh, So the question was how to do that, you know, forget that I'm already a few hundred pages into the book and I have to go back and change everything. But uh, just logistically, how you, how do you do that? Can this can this character meet that character? Can this character actually be that other character? Can you right. find creatively how do, how can we make all this work? How can we salvage as much of these new pages as possible? And then the third wave that you spoke of uh, at this point, I'm even further into the book, so it's an even bigger pain in the ass. Uh, Chris, um, the man, his manager, uh, digs up a letter, a uh, very important uh, nine page note where he outlines where he was going with not all, but uh, some of the, uh, the plot threads. Right. So at the end of the day, once I had all of them, there's a few other little things we found, but at the end of the day, what I was looking at was a, about a third of a novel plus notes where uh, a good portion of it was going and it was spread out. So it wasn't right. like he wrote the first third and stopped. That would have been, it's you know difficult, but understandable. This was way more complicated. It was, some stuff in the beginning, some stuff at the very end, some stuff in the middle, and I had to somehow make it all fluid and uh, feel somewhat natural. Right. Did you ever, I mean, was there ever that moment of self-doubt where you're like, what the hell have I gotten myself into? I, I can't do this. I can't do it justice. Yeah, I'm sure there there were moments where it seemed too daunting because what George had set out to do was clearly something epic. Yeah. Uh, he had, he had set uh, clearly was setting up something that uh, was getting bigger and bigger with every uh, page that he wrote. So I right. knew I was something that was going to be really long and um, arduous in that sense. So yeah, I'm sure I had some down moments, but um, generally what I did with the living dead and what I've, what I did with, you know, working with Guillermo and, uh, you know, when these big moments come up is I, uh, I, I convince myself that I've got it, you know, like my right. only defense is, uh, overconfidence swagger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I do right. the same thing, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just get like, I just force myself, even though it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's all kind of false. I, I force myself to think, fuck yeah, I got this shit. Uh, <laughs> and it's just self-defense. It's just yep. a, a shield that I put up. That way I can get right to work. Exactly. Uh, and just don't give yourself time to doubt. And there was a lot of work to do. And, and a lot of it was 
you know, before I even got to the writing. So I, so that made it especially easy to just get to work because I had a lot of research to do. So I just started hitting the books. Well, now you mentioned its size. I mean, and it is, it's, in my opinion, it's the zombie epic he always wanted to make that Hollywood never, ever, ever gave him the budget to do. Exactly. Um, one thing I'm curious about, have you ever read the unfilmed script for Day of the Dead? Yes. Okay. You know, because some of that he recycled, of course, into Land of the Dead. Right. Um, but there was stuff in Living Dead as I'm reading it, and I'm like, you know, I, I think I think maybe George was thinking about this all the way back from that Day of the Dead script. I yeah, mean, did you I, get that impression too? I, I thought of that too. Um, you know, part of my research was going back and rewatching and rereading everything, and that included the screenplays. So I definitely reread um, v- different versions of of uh, Day of the Dead. Right. <clears throat> and I do think I don't. There are s- some smaller elements. Uh, from that original day script that I do see echoes of in living dead. Yeah. And, but mostly I feel like it was the overall feel of it, the overall grandeur of the original day of the dead that he, that he longed for, you know, yes. that it got away from him. And, you know, he, although he had a bit bigger budget on land, it, it just wasn't that kind of story. It was a yeah. kind of a high rise uh, story. Uh, and I feel like he never – it hurt a little bit, I think, for him. Now, me, I, I love – it's hard to – I mean, I love the way day is now. I love day of the day. I love how tight it is. I like how it's more or less one location. That's my favorite kind of story. Um, but I think, it, I think it stung. It stung, George. And for sure, at least according to Sue's, the book was a place that he would return to uh, when – the movie life got particularly shitty, you yeah. know, like, and his, obviously his career was scored with disappointments and slashed budgets and a million projects that almost got made. Yep. And here, no one could stop him. There were no producers. There was no, no one could slash his budget on a book. Right. Yeah. That's very much the sense I got from reading it. One, one character that really stuck out to me, Etta Huffman, um, yeah. without spoilers, you know, she's she's a character who's on the spectrum. Um, I was curious. Her voice is so realistic and believable. Was she your creation or was she George's creation? Uh, almost all the characters are George's creation. All okay. Almost all the major characters, except Hoffman. Uh, Hoffman was uh, my invention. Uh, the the world in which Hoffman exists, uh, the office that she's in, the work she's doing, all of that was there. Yeah. Uh, from George's work. Um, I, it was my addition that for various plot reasons, once I started to try to string everything together, that I felt that those sections needed a, a central character. Right. Um, and then sort of obvious, I mean, I, there's a lot of homages to Tales of Hoffman, George's favorite film. Yeah. There are dozens and dozens of them in the book, but the most obvious one is this character. That's called. that's what I that's what uh, I wanted. Hoffman. I told you when when I got the arc and I finished, it, I said I got a lot of questions, but yeah, that was that was high on the list. Right. So I'm I saw so the the biggest character that I created was Etta Hoffman, and it was as long as I'm going to create a character, I was going to make it um, uh, a nod to George and right. uh, the that movie he loved, and you know in the in the opera. Hoffman is a poet who uh, tells stories. And uh, so I have Etta's coworkers have nicknamed her the poet sarcastically. She doesn't talk at all. And what she does is she ends up keeping the record of the, the falling world. And yep. so in that, in that sense, she becomes the storyteller. She becomes the whole thing becomes a tale of Hoffman, if you will. Oh, I I thought that was marvelously done, and I, I and seriously, man, no bullshit. You know, forget we're recording. I've forgotten we're recording. I do that all the time, but I, I just you you nailed it. You brought it home. You know, I I meant what I said. They they made the right choice. You know, out of out of the dozens and dozens of candidates out there, they could have picked. They they went with the right one, and. I mean, you you absolutely nailed it. You should be very very proud. I know it's 
it's your 10th book and there there'll be many books after this but this is definitely one to to say i did that well i mean i uh, listen there's there's a f- you know there's a few people out there who when they say that it touches me deeply and you're one of them you know uh, i think Suze was uh, the biggest of all you know when she yeah. told me that no one could have d- done this uh as I did it, um, and uh, you know, whatever, and that may or may not be true. It's probably not true, but still, just like that's the that's the only reviews I need um, right. in in a project like this, where it's so much. I mean, it's all just coming from the heart. I mean, just between the two of us, I assume no one else is listening. Uh, <laughs> like this is the kind of thing I would. I mean, obviously, I got paid and all that, but I mean, I would have done this for free. Like this yeah. is like. You know, it took three years of my life and it's nearly 700 pages. But I mean, this is the kind of thing you do because it's it's part of you. It's like the right. closing of a circle that that started being drawn before you were barely even self-aware. Yeah. Well, you know, let's let's talk about that. Let's let's talk about creativity a little bit here before I let you go. You know, I, I said earlier, you and I, I, I suspect we have very, very similar creative processes. Um, we always have to be writing yeah. and we always have to be working on more than one thing at a time. But I also know where and I, if I were in your shoes, I would probably have a tendency just to focus on this and let other things slide. Did you find that happening or were you able to? To, to a certain degree, everything else had to be sidelined at when this book came on because it was a it was a major project and at the very beginning there was um the 50th anniversary of Night Living Dead was coming up right and at the very beginning we thought well maybe maybe we can we can hit that date that soon became obvious that that was hilariously <laughs> optimistic <laughs> and that there was no chance in hell but uh at that point I had I had pushed everything to the side and and already you know redid the deadline you know got all the deadlines and those shifted right. um and it really became the the pr- priority and you know it may, I, I was happy to do it you know this it was i wasn't dealing with my own book anymore this is i had a I, the romero estate in, involved in this and i wanted to i had to give them uh priority so yeah everything everything off the table uh but generally you're absolutely correct uh and I mean, I'd kind of be interested in your your take on this, but uh, you know, I think people who tend to just work on one thing and concentrate on it until it's finished, um, I get that. But what I and they, they are confused by people like us who have rotating, rotating oh, yeah. uh, lazy Susan of projects. But what I find is that uh, you know, if you're just working on one thing, you finish it, you finish a draft, and then you have to sit around and wait for it to your your brain to decompress from it. But when you have multiple projects going on, and ideally, for me, they're wildly different, which is why I yes. write for all ages and uh, not just horror. Uh, so that, you know, if I finish a draft or a section of book A and then pick up book B, you know, each project becomes a palate cleanser for the other project. And you can actually return to it much quickly. Yep, absolutely. So it's this, uh, th- it actually helps me to have multiple projects. Every project benefits from it, I think. Same here. Um, I, I, it, I absolutely agree with the, the palate cleanser analogy. And, and I find, you know, on those days when, and, and we all have them, those days where I just cannot get into what I'm working on. Yeah. If I switch over to one of the other projects, you know, then the, the creativity is there. The energy is, is there that day. You know, it's just something different. Um, I know Mary thinks I'm insane. Mary is a uh, work mm-hmm. on one, one project at a time person. She's actually listening in the background. Give me a side eye right ah, now. Ah, Hey, Hey, what's up? Speak, speak loud. Are, are, are Dan and I crazy people? Uh, I'll be honest. I always thought you were until now. I understand the, the theory behind it, though. A little oh, better. So I was crazy until <laughs> Daniel Kraus comes out. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Daniel makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> you, I don't know. Glad to help. Thanks, buddy. So once you finish Living Dead, then, yeah, and you let go of it, we're were you sort of overwhelmed with all the things you had put on the sideline or was it easy to fall back in? 
No, it was easy. I mean, even even a book of this size and uh, scope, there's going to be parts. Uh, there are going to be times where it's with the editor. You know, like they're going to they're going right. to, and it's, since it's so long, they're going to need a, a couple months. Uh, so I shoot it over to tour. Suddenly, I have a couple months free. Finish a draft on something else that's much shorter. Start something, a third thing that's brand new. Uh, until the Living Dead comes back, so right. it nothing really changed in that regard. And you know, the, there's the, there's three modeled after Tales of Hoffman, which has three acts. The book has three acts, and they're all fairly distant from each other. There's like the initial outbreak, and then kind of the middle section, which is where you would place all of George's zombie movies, and then there's an act that's. 15 years into the future. Right. So the, I, they could also be treated to a certain respect as separate books. Um, so I was able to even separate them uh, more than usual. Yeah. I like the, uh, the fast forward to the future, by the way, I, I thought that, that, I mean, he, he talked about some of those ideas in interviews before and, and yeah. you see it suggested in other works, but to, to see it crystallized like that, I thought was really, really cool. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, you're right. Like if you dig deep into his interviews and his commentary tracks, uh, you do get a hint of some of it. And, and the stuff that wasn't there in black and white or in audio, you could, if you, I mean, if you just study hard enough, you can start to map it. Right. So he made, he made six zombie films. So if you study those six films, you you understand and understand the trajectory of points one through six. You right. should be able to begin to uh, be able to estimate what seven, eight, nine, ten might be. Right. You know, it's it's almost like it's zombie math. You just kind of work <laughs> it out. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of like simplicity to it. Uh, you know, and the author's note goes into detail about all this stuff, uh, how I came to my conclusion. So if anyone reads that and disagrees with me, then that's, that's cool. Uh, but, um, the, the idea was, yeah, the idea was uh, really simple at its core. Uh, eventually using Romero's own numbers of zombies versus humans that he puts out in day of the dead, uh, which chronologically is still the final dead film. Once you put them in order, right. Um, there is going to be a time where there, there's very few humans left and the zombies aren't really being created anymore because the very few humans that are left understand how to dispatch uh, dead people. And so the zombies are going to start rotting, you know, yeah. and there's going to be very few people and ultimately very few zombies. And the zombies that are there are going to be essentially like elderly people. They're going yep. to be they're going to be weak they're going to be slowly stumbling and falling to the ground. And they suddenly become this, I think in George's perspective, and I know in my perspective, they suddenly become something rather sympathetic. Yes. And George was, you know, a through line through his films uh, was he got increasingly sympathetic yep. to the zombies and always, and this was, you know, in his own words, you know, it was always a story you know, his zombie films were, were always a story about an uprising. Right. You know, an underclass uprising to take down a, uh, a spoiled, uh, go, meat gone wrong, uh, uh, overlording upper class. And so, you know, once you, once you realize that and you understand that George was a 60s radical protester and still was in his heart, you see that all right we're we're watching an uprising and we're and who do you who do you root for if you're George Romero and watching an uprising you root for the yeah. uprisers yeah you know and so a lot of the, the f core philosophy of the novel is really about all right so if if we're rooting for the zombies then what are they here what are they here to do is there a larger purpose that they're part of and so using a lot of these context clues uh and stuff that's that's in the text and in stuff external to the text that he was involved with you start to be able to see uh rash rational uh ideas in why the zombies are here 
and why the, what they're here to do. If we're if we're the bad guys, if the zombie plague isn't a zombie plague, it's a human plague, and the zombies are the antibodies. Why? Right. And that was the big question, the big why question for me. And I came up with a, I think, a compelling uh, answer to that why question. And again, I lay it all out in the author's notes. So if you think it's all bullshit, you will at least have all the evidence you need to call it bullshit. So I, I was nodding when I got to your author's note. I was nodding and pumping my fist in the air. I, I think you nailed it. Um, I, I think anybody who's as much as a fanboy of these films as I am is going to agree. Um, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, all right. Well, listen, man, I know you've got, like we said at the beginning, you got other interviews today. One thing I want to touch on, and if you can't comment on it, don't. Okay. Okay. A lot of times people let something slip on this show that they shouldn't have. And then later they're <laughs> like, Oh, why did I let you talk me into that? I, thank you for the <laughs> so, warning. Um, uh, you know, George's, uh, his papers, uh, or archive at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, you had an opportunity to go through those, correct? Yes. Is there a possibility there may be other novels, short stories, things like that in the future? Uh, there, There is a possibility. Um, it would be er- erroneous to say that I went through everything. I kind of thought I did, but apparently there's a, there's a, they're, they're turning up tons of more stuff that I didn't see. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that there are... And again, the author's note lists a lot of them, but there are countless scripts. Uh, in, I mean, really, you get a, a seriously palpable sense of how badly George wanted to do other stuff. Yeah. Uh, because these scripts, there's a lot of horror in there, but there's a lot that's not horror. Yeah. Uh, he, there are just, I mean, there might be hundreds of screenplays. Um, and once you add in the partial screenplays and the treatments, my God, the treatments, there are just so many treatments. Some may be one page, some may be 40 pages, but I mean, so many ideas there. Uh, will some of those be developed and um, some of those made into films? I, I, I would expect yes. Yeah. Um, there's a lot there. And I think the the, task that Sue Romero has and she's doing a great job of it is uh, being protective of it. Right. Um, And uh, you know, by her own uh, story, you know, George dies and the phone starts ringing off the hook and it it kind of pissed her off, you know, like where were you all, all these years that George couldn't get anything made, you know, and suddenly everybody wants a piece. You know, what's in the treasure chest? Can we all get a little nugget of it? Um, and so she basically put pumped the brakes pretty hard. Um, and I was like, we'll, we'll, we're going to look at th- look at stuff and we're going to go in our picks. Um, but yeah, I think the answer is a big yes. I think it's yeah. inevitable that a lot of this stuff um, will come out um, in one way or the other. And certainly all of it will be viewable by the public. You know, once yeah. these archives are processed, anyone can go in there. You know, anyone can uh, l- actually look at the physical pieces, you know, like she could have, cool. she could have kept all that stuff in a locked chest and instead she opened it up so that people yeah. could learn from it. That's pretty cool. That's very cool. That's very cool. All right. Well, Daniel, we will let you get going. Promise me one thing. Yeah. After, after the press tour is over, you know, the pandemic will still continue. We're still all going to be in our houses another six months. Come back on and let's do a, a full interview and go through everything. Yeah, we need to, because one of my favorite reads this year has been your triangle of belief. And I have so many questions about right. that. Uh, I was, I just find that whole thing utterly fascinating and nothing scares me. Like I don't in life, things scare me, right. but movies and, and books never, ever scare me. This book scared me. It creeped me out. Well, uh, I, You know, I think it goes back to what you said at the beginning. You know, uh, you're introduced to something scary at a young age and you either run away from it or you run toward it. Yeah. Um, You know, if you've read that book, then, you know, yeah, I would have been the kid crawling under that bed with you to get a glimpse of the monster. (laughs) We we would have had some good sleepovers for sure. (laughs) All right, brother. Well, yeah, we will plan on that then. Definitely. Excellent. I can't wait. 
All right, man. Daniel Krause, thanks for coming. Uh, Living Dead on sale next week, folks. Uh, do not miss out. I'm telling you, it's one of my favorite books of the year. And now back to the studio. All right, so there you have it. Like I said, one of my favorite interviews that we've done. It was a year. good interview. Yeah, yeah um, really I mean, he was he was it was heartfelt, and he he was straight up about it. And uh, yeah, we're definitely going to have him back on again later this year because there's there's a whole oh yeah other end to his career, not an end, but a whole other side to his career that we didn't even get to touch. <laughs> I was on. kind of curious about like you know his working with Guillermo del Toro. I knew you, know. you would be. Yeah, because I like Yamal Del Toro. Del Toro fangirl that you are. I am. I am. So. Fuck, Mary kill. <laughs> <laughs> I know what her answer is going to be for that. Baby, you're the only one I want to fuck, Mary. I don't want to kill you. <laughs> I, I don't want to kill you, but... I'm sure that sounded better inside it your head. It probably sounded better in my you're head. You're the only one I want to fuck, Mary and put in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily, Not in, necessarily that in that order. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, this got horribly. I want to remind folks uh, while you're at GoFundMe, uh, Jose Castillo fu funeral and more. But also mm -hmm. while you're there, help Dave Thomas. Yes, um, please. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> car repairs. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mary, you want to remind folks about uh, Book Expo? Buzzbook. Buzzbook. Buzzbook Expo. Yes, uh, the twenty second and twenty third. We will be doing a live stream Buzzbook Expo where we will have publishers come and, and talk to, uh, readers, book reviewers, uh, podcasters, booksellers, and, and, and just, you know, just general readers about the books that they have coming out in horror for the next, you know, few months of 2020 and for, you know, the bulk of 2021. It's going to have, you know, Q and A's and presentations and, and all kinds of fun things like that. So, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you came to the stream and, and watched. Uh, it'll be on the Brian Keen YouTube. You can just stream it from there. Right. Um, but, you know, more details will be coming, going out this week and, uh, a schedule, a tentative schedule has been, uh, written up i just i have to you know talk to some publishers and, and just make sure that the time slots are okay there are still currently a few slots left for publishers if they're interested in joining the expo but i would need to know um i mean if this airs thursday i'd kind of need to know you know by the weekend if you want to be a part of this so that i can finalize the schedule and get that ready to go uh, right. But I think it's going to be a good. I think it's going to be a good thing. It's going to be interesting. Awesome, and of course, Matt, uh, our own Matt Wilson, buy his books, buy all of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to Amazon. <laughs> all of them. Wilson, buy all of them. Buy Sounds all good. of them. Are you still doing signed ones from home, or are you out of stock? I have a couple left, not very many. So, but I'm also got a new book coming out this month. Oh yeah. Well, dun, 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 dun. Uh, the last Tuesday of the month is that the twenty fifth. I think something like that. Twenty, yeah. yeah. Well, twenty second, twenty third is a Saturday and Sunday. So twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Yes. All right. Calendars are great. There we go. <laughs> All right, and uh, that's it. I'll just remind people uh, for advertising or booking inquiries. Just go to briankeen dot com. Click podcast slash radio. All the information you need is there. I will tell you right now, folks. August is sold out. We have no ad space left for August. Uh, wah, wah. so if, if, if you, if you delayed, I'm sorry, but we can't help you. If you uh, snooze, you lose. <laughs> yeah. The reason for that is because advertising on the Brian Keen Radio Network gets you results. And speaking of the Brian Keen Radio Network, I want to remind you, WBKR plays for free 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you can hear an eclectic assortment of music. In fact, one of Dave's favorite bands, Porcupine Tree, is playing right now, right as I say this. As it should be. Wow. It's going to be followed up by Olivia Newton-John, and that's the Actually. eclecticness <laughs> that breaks Dave. Uh, All I'm going to say is, Olivia <laughs> Newton-John. All I'm going to say is, of course I come downstairs the other day, and I'm, I'm treated to the delightful tones of John Travolta. <laughs> um, I would play Grease music. Well, no, that's not music. Um I, I can't think of anybody who's like, I really wish I could hear John Travolta sing right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Phoebe, do you do you sing the Grease music? I sing to just about anything. Dave's favorite phrase at home is the sing light is not on. Yes, you know, Phoebe. <laughs> I got chills. Oh, They're no. multiplying. <laughs> and I'm losing control. <laughs> oh, my God. 
what, what was the name of the singer? John Travolta. Yeah, we should keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, wah, wah. Listen, wah. listen to Brian Keen Radio, and not only will you hear music, but you will hear Grindcast, The Hard Show with Brian Keen, Defenders Dialogue, Cosmic Shenanigans, and at night, exclusively, only on Brian Keen Radio, <laughs> our overnight man, the Venus flytrap <laughs> to our WKRP, John Urban Sick, classic episodes of Ink Stains, and music programmed by John as well. Um, all really? of that. Brian Keen Radio, again, just go to briankeen.com, click podcast slash radio. It's all right there. We will see you next week for Phoebe Unleashed, the quarantine edition. <laughs> Woo Bye. 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 The Horror Show with Brian Keen is a production of the Brian Keen Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is written by Brian Keene and produced by Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Matt Wilderson, and Dave Thomas. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, Cosmic Shenanigans, Defenders Dialogue, and Grindcast. To advertise on The Horror Show with Brian Keene, visit briankeen.com and click Podcasts.